remember that uh, little mansion just outside the city limits? <laughs> well, it turns out the wine cellar was untouched. Picked up a few cases of your favorite Bordeaux. It's an exaggeration. I don't drink too much. You know, I work hard all day. I... Why would you even say that? Hey, and welcome to an academics over analysis, uh, in this case, of uh, the Umbrella Academy. So I'm Joel Rosenfeld. I'm an academic. I'm actually a professor at a university. I write papers and I bring in grant money and uh, and yeah, I, I overanalyze everything. My family and friends tell me I look into things way too deeply. Uh, things like cooking a turkey, uh, reading random books, uh, watching a TV show. I will pick it apart to uh, the tiniest detail uh, that nobody else seems to care about. But I'm hoping you do. And, uh, and so uh, here we are. So uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, the Umbrella Academy. So I've picked out a couple of scenes uh, that sort of fall within sort of my wheelhouse of things I could talk about. And, um, and yeah, uh, mostly this revolves around uh, five. Uh, so uh, if you haven't seen the show, I'm going to stop you right here and tell you to go watch it. It's an excellent show. It's on Netflix. And um, I'm going to give away a lot of spoilers. So uh, yeah, uh, you've been warned. And, uh, and now let's go ahead and talk about it. So uh, in this first scene here, uh, we see that uh, Five has uh, been trapped in the future after he uh, recklessly uh, leaps ahead uh, despite the advice of his father. And, um, and now he's like ahead into uh, the apocalypse. And, uh, and he's lived there for apparently many, many years. And uh, he's been uh, doing his studies uh, in quantum mechanics. How do I know it's quantum mechanics? Well, for one, uh, when they talk about, uh, when Five and his father talk about time travel, uh, they do mention uh, quantum mechanics quite explicitly. So, uh, so that gives you sort of a hint of where to start with uh, looking at uh, the things that he's doing. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, scrawls behind him, I, uh, on both the chalkboard, you can kind of make out uh, something that we call Schrodinger's equation, and uh, or rather the time-independent Schrodinger's equation. And uh, and then if you also look behind uh, his mannequin, uh, Dolores, I believe, I uh, you will see uh, there is the solution to the the free uh, the free particle solution to uh, the Schrodinger's equation. So. What is the Schrodinger's equation, and uh, and yeah, how does it fit into all this stuff? So Schrodinger's equation, uh, what is that? Uh, so um, Schrodinger's equation is the equation that was uh, introduced by Schrodinger. I think it was around the 1930s or so. I'll put the actual uh, year around here. I uh, and it was meant to uh, sort of characterize everything that happens to. Uh, and it happens in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's one of several formulations of quantum mechanics, uh, and, um, and Dirac uh, tied together uh, matrix mechanics with Schrodinger's equation uh, later on. Um, and so uh, it is one of the main things you learn in uh, a basic 101 course to quantum mechanics. Uh, it is technically a PDE, so there is a what we call a time derivative, so the equation depends on time and the change in time, and there's also a spatial derivative, and that mean, and this appears through uh, the Laplacian, or just uh, two derivatives if it's just a single variable uh, equation. Uh, so this uh, govern this equation, just like in Newton's using Newton's law to determine sort of how everything happens in classical mechanics. Uh, so f equals m a, right? Uh, this uh, that works the same way, but in quantum mechanics. And so you have these things that we call wave packets, or uh, or sort of quantum particles, and um, and Schrodinger's equation tells you how they move and how they change. Uh, so what is this wave packet? Well, it's sort of a probability distribution of uh, where uh, sort of the state of the system is going to be. And so when you solve Schrodinger's equation, you get these probability distributions and it tells you, uh, you know, different things about the particle. Um, now Schrodinger's equation is only solvable for like a handful of potentials and that's that equation V there. And so we ha we can solve uh, Schrodinger's equation in very, very few uh, V. Uh, one, when V is zero, we can do that. 
uh, when uh, v is equal to a quadratic function, we call that the um, harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonic oscillator, and we can solve that. Uh, that's actually related a little bit to my research. And, uh, and then we can also do it for the infinite uh, square well and uh, the finite square well. And, um, and the finite square well is kind of where we get these concepts of things like quantum tunneling. And so, uh, so that's kind of fun. Now, if you, uh, now, uh, what you see on the chalkboard there isn't actually uh, the Schrodinger's equation as I've described it. So you'll notice it psi uh, is there, and that's our uh, quantum state, uh, but it has double prime. And so it's not, say, a Laplacian, so that's different. So it means it's only one variable. Uh, and, uh, and on the other hand, uh, there's no time derivative. Uh, psi double prime corresponds to the, uh, to the spatial derivative. So uh, where does this come from? It turns out for all of those uh, potentials that I mentioned that uh, those are time independent. And so when you have a time independent potential, you can actually separate it into two different equations. And so you basically you make the assumption that your, uh, your state, your quantum state is uh, is a product of two uh, different functions, one in terms of time and one in terms of uh, the state itself, and this is called a separation of variables. And uh, and then what you can do is you can transform that equation and move all the time to the one side and all the, the spatial terms to the other side, and then you basically get a function of time is equal to a function of space. And, uh, and since those are two completely different variables, uh, you can make the fundamental jump uh, there that, uh, well, that must be constant because if the left hand side doesn't change with respect to x but the right hand side does i uh, then and, and and vice versa with time i uh, then the only way those two equations can be equal is if they were both constant and so then that gives you an ability to separate these two guys and that gives you the sort of e which becomes your energy levels so i uh, anyway uh that's all that's sort of the mathematics behind it uh h bar in there by the way i uh, is Planck's constant i uh, and um yeah that's a. Uh, uh, that, that's a fundamental thing that comes out of quantum mechanics. Now, if you look behind Dolores, what the equation that she has there uh, is supposed to be e to the minus i k x uh, times some constant plus, I'm guessing another e to the i k 2 x or something uh, uh, behind her is a little hard to read. And what that is, is it is the uh, solution to the, the free particle uh, equ equation, which is what you get when you have your potential being equal to zero. Now, I, this, uh, now, as far as what all these equations mean and how they all work together, uh, well, unfortunately, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, it's not like you're going to be able to infer from a television show how to do time travel with quantum mechanics. Uh, so the, the free particle is supposed to be the 101 sort of uh, solution to a quantum mechanics problem uh, you know, that you get in, in undergraduate. Um, and you can get there within a couple days. Uh, it's sort of funny that he would actually write uh, the solution to the free particle on the wall at all, because um, truly, uh, if he's at this level where he's doing uh, time travel calculations and determining uh, who needs to die in order to change the future, uh, I doubt he needs to write the solution to the free, uh, the free particle equation. So, uh, so yeah, so that's in there. And another thing uh, that you notice there is that I said it is e to the minus i k x. Uh, but if you look, uh, there's no dot on that i. It is. It looks like a one, and so it looks like it's negative one k x. And so that's sort of an indication that it was from somebody who is unfamiliar with uh, the material, uh, copying it down and sketching it on the board. Um, I mean, it could be that the the dot in the i got wiped out, um, but uh, I mean. It doesn't look like there was anything there before, and uh, and yeah, so uh, it's sort of a, a funny gaff uh, there in that that equation. So uh, so yeah, so that's that's the Schrodinger equation, and that's the sort of thing he's writing on the board. A lot of the other stuff looks like it's kind of gibberish. Uh, they there are uh, things like s and e and things like that. E probably corresponds to energy levels, which would fit with quantum mechanics. Uh, s uh, is usually representing something like entropy. Uh, yeah, when we when we talk about thermodynamics, and so that might be where that comes from, but. Uh, uh, outside of that, I'm not really sure. I'm not a physicist, I am a mathematician, uh, but my uh, my brother is a physicist, and so I sent all these pictures to him uh, without a subject line in the email, and I just sent, and so he called me kind of concerned. Um, and uh, and so yeah, yeah, he, he sort of agreed my assessment here. Um, but yeah, so I, 
What else in the scene can we look at? Well, if you look at uh, throughout uh, the thing, he has books scattered all over the place. Uh, and they look like they're basically uh, introductory books to, say, quantum mechanics or relativity or relativistic cosmology and things like that. I tried to look up all the book titles that I could. Uh, you can't really make out many of them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's really hard to pin down uh, exactly where th what these books are. Uh, some of the books, like Foundations and Quantum Mechanics, uh, that might be a book by Springer? Uh, it's such a generic title that it's kind of hard to, to look up. Uh, I'm guessing that the, the showrunners um, just I went to the library and just checked out a whole bunch of books and uh, and then left um, and just to scatter them around in this scene. Um, so I, I imagine they're real books. I doubt they would make up random books uh, for this, this scene. Um, but yeah. One book that does stand out though is um, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Um, and that is by Neil deGrasse Tyson. That book actually came out only like a year or two before the, the television show uh, premiered. And so, uh, so it's a nice little, um, you know, homage to uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, yeah, but otherwise, the books, I can't really tell where else they were, are from. Uh, you can tell that they are kind of library books. Uh, they all have those little white stickers on them. Now, somebody might have bought a whole bunch of books and put the stickers on them themselves, but it's probably a lot cheaper to just go to your uh, local library for the uh, and just check them out for one scene, and, which is I, what I imagine they, they probably did. They just went into the, the uh, sort of physics section and just grabbed everything they could. And so I'm guessing a lot of these textbooks, uh, you know, aren't probably just like a really 101 type books uh, because libraries rarely have anything more sophisticated unless they went to a university library uh, but then they would have to be a university student and so I mean, they might have student interns and so that's a possibility but uh, but it, in reality I uh, it's probably just from your their local public library so um, so so that was interesting um, out of that scene so uh, next let's go ahead and talk about um, yeah, the scene between uh, one and uh, and five, and uh, and so here uh, we can see that uh, one uh, that five is actually going through and doing a whole lot of um, computations all over the his bedroom walls, and uh, and yeah, uh, we'll see a lot of the same equations that we saw before. Uh, again, we see Schrodinger's equation and uh, and the solution to the free particle, etc. Um, and the, the rest of it, I'm not really sure what else is in there. There's some guy, uh, Milton, uh, that is written on the wall, and, uh, and etc. Uh, but yeah, let, let's go ahead and watch that real quick. Oh. Okay, I think I've got something, Dolores. It's tenuous, but promising. Who are you talking to? What is all this? It's a probability map. Probability of what? Of whose death could save the world. I've narrowed it down to four. Are you saying one of these four people causes the apocalypse? No, I'm saying that their death might prevent it. Oh. I'm not following. Time is fickle, Luther. The slightest alteration in events can lead to massively different outcomes in the time continuum. The butterfly effect. So all I have to do is find the people with the greatest probability of impacting the timeline, whoever they may be, and kill them. Milton Green. So who's he, a terrorist or something? I believe he is a gardener. You can't be serious. But this is madness, Five. Yeah. Where, where'd you get that? Dad's room. I think he used it to shoot a rhinoceros. But similar to the model I used at work. Nice shoulder fit and highly reliable. But you can't. This guy, Milton, is just an innocent man. It's basic math. His death could potentially save the lives of billions. If I did nothing, he'd be dead in four days anyway. The apocalypse won't spare anyone. We don't do this kind of thing. We are not doing anything. I am. We can't let you go and kill innocent people, Five, no matter how many lives you'll save. Well, good luck stopping me. You're not going anywhere. Put her down. Put the gun down. You're not killing anyone today. I know she's important to you, so don't make me do this. It's either her or the gun. You decide. I can keep doing this all day. Okay. So, uh, there we see uh, five and one talking and uh, about uh, what Five is doing all over those walls with uh, Chalk in, uh, in his old bedroom. 
So what we know is that Five is trying to uh, figure out who he needs to kill in order to keep the apocalypse from happening. And so he's sort of trying to exploit uh, what we call the butterfly effect, where uh, if you uh, change one little thing, uh, like a butterfly flaps its wings over here, uh, you can cause a tornado happening over here. And so he's hoping by uh, you know, taking out one particular person, uh, that he can cause a cascade of effects that will prevent the end of the world. Um, now, this person isn't necessarily even a very important person, he, uh, at least uh, from an everyday sort of standpoint. Uh, it is somebody who's not in charge of, like, firing nuclear missiles, or is not an admiral, or anything like that. Not a, you know, mob boss. He is a florist. Uh, and so, uh, according to his calculations, uh, it seems that the florist is a very important person for the effect of uh, having the apocalypse. How is he doing these computations? Well, it looks like he's appealing to quantum mechanics yet again, uh, and he's starting with the free particle. Um, so that uh, sort of tells you that he's sort of on this impossible mission from going from first principles about a single particle, trying to build up to uh, through social dynamics and all these other things to who needs to die in order to save the world. Um, I, and truly, if he's going to do these computations, he needs a lot more than the walls in his room. Uh, and probably a lot more time than 10 days. Uh, so I, you can look around and you again see uh, the free particle equation uh, and the time independent Schrodinger equation that happens after you do the separation that I talked about before. And uh, and then later on in, in other aspects of the things you can, it's, it's hard to make out a lot of things. It's a lot of mathematical scrawl that's sort of up and around. Uh, maybe these are notes uh, for himself uh, in, in sort of different ways, um, but it doesn't make a whole lot of coherent sense uh, out of context at the very least. Uh, if you look through there, you'll see symbols like E and S, uh, which might again correspond to entropy and energy and uh and again like i said you also see uh free particle solutions floating around so i just told you a sort of a hopeless mission uh to go from the free particle up to uh you know uh saving the world so then the question is uh is uh his task even feasible uh you know assuming that you don't start from first principles is there some way to go about this uh, and so let's just sort of step back and take a look at what he's trying to accomplish. And he's trying to uh, predict the future with mathematics. Um, now, this is a, generally a very, very hard thing to do, uh, but uh, people do it all the time. Uh, so, uh, although they aren't exactly predicting uh, the end of the world, uh, but Amazon, Google, and uh, Facebook all make all their money based on making predictions about the future. And this is generally speaking uh, called machine learning and AI to an extent. And so uh, in their case, in Facebook's case, uh, they just want to be able to predict which links you're gonna, and advertisements you're gonna click on so they can sell it to their advertisers. Uh, so they've seen all your behavior up to that point and they're like, okay, well, I think this guy would really like to uh, buy a package of kittens for Christmas, I guess. Uh, do you buy packages of kittens? I, I don't think you do, but you get the idea. Uh, Amazon makes the money the same sort of way, all of his recommendations and new products that you should probably check out and books and things like that, and honestly, tragically, is almost always right. I have lost so much money to Amazon for buying books that I don't need. I uh, And I filled several bookshelves. So they do a very good job of predicting the future, or at least predicting my behavior. Um, and, uh, and Google, same thing, and it's ads and other things like that. It even puts an ad inside of your Gmail uh, while you're checking your mail to uh, you know, see if it can get you. And yeah, and it even sculpts the results of your searches according to what they think you would like to see. So I pulled up a bunch of papers uh, that are basically around what is generally referred to as social dynamics. Uh, social dynamics, uh, you know, is basically using uh, observed behavior in order to model uh, future behavior and uh, and make predictions about it. Uh, the FBI uh, and NSA both really care about uh, these sort of things, uh, CIA as well, uh, because they would like to be able to use it to, uh, say, detect extremists and uh, and prevent terror attacks. Um, and so, uh, so you find people from just like the business side of things, trying to sell you products, to uh, the government trying to uh, you know stop uh, you know terrorist attacks and other things like that. So you can find a whole bunch of papers out there on this. And so here's a, a accumulation of things. Uh, so uh, University of Essex 
uh, the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering right now is actually looking for a PhD student and uh, to look into modeling belief dynamics of social media users with machine learning methodologies. Uh, and so then there's other ones. Uh, there's analyzing and inferring human real life behavior through online social networks with social influence deep learning. And so this is by Luca Luceri, uh, Torsten Braun, and Silvia Giordano. And, uh, and they say that, and so their abstract says, the advent of online social networks has offered the opportunity to study the dynamics of information spread and influence propagation at a huge scale. Social influence plays a crucial role in shaping people's behavior and affecting human decisions in various domains. We introduce social influence deep learning, that's a machine learning sort of thing, uh, a framework that combines deep learning with network science. Uh, network basically means connectivity and uh, on graphs and things like that. So, uh, so for instance, a network might be like the network between you and your friends and your parents, and you have basically uh, this graph that has a whole bunch of points representing each of these people and the edge that connects, uh, you know, them through their. Um, uh, uh, through their social connections. And so they're trying to uh, predict human behavior on real world activities, such as attending an event or visiting a location, and etc. They keep going. Uh, so I, so here they're trying to uh, sort of predict whether or not somebody's going to attend an event. So maybe uh, one or the other of them event invited a whole bunch of people to a party and they decided and nobody showed up. And so that inspired them, these academics, to go ahead and write a paper and figure out why nobody came to their party. It might be that it was a party run by academics. Um, so uh, you can find this other one. Uh, there's a person who gave a talk uh, near Rosenfeld uh, on machine learning and social dynamics. And so, uh, in this case, they say, in this talk, they present uh, several works on the interplay between machine learning and social dynamics. In some cases, they're doing the same thing that the, the last paper was doing, but also they use uh, social dynamics as a way of training machine learning algorithms, is another thing that they do. Uh, not to go into that too much deeply. Uh, on Plus One, there's a, uh, a article titled, Understanding the Dynamics of Terrorism Events with Multidiscipline Datasets and Machine and machine learning approach. And this is uh, by Fang Yu Ding uh, and uh, a whole bunch of other authors I cannot pronounce. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with Chinese names. And uh, and yeah, uh, so uh, that's another, so that's an example of a national security sort of problem where people are looking into it. And um, and so then uh, you also see academically, uh, Berkeley, uh, their electrical engineering and computer science department, uh, they had a whole class uh, devoted to machine learning and social dynamics. Uh, but then uh, just to plug my postdoctoral uh, mentor, um, he, uh, he published a paper called Containment Control for a Social Network with State-Dependent Connectivity. And there he had uh, these social networks um, and he was trying to model um, social dynamics with uh, what are called fractional order op operators. And, um, and yeah, so that, that sort of allowed, there's a sort of history component to uh, fractional order dynamics that uh, allows you to sort of, um, sort of model learning uh, of uh, an individual agent in some case, agent being a person or something like that. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so academically that's what we see. Uh, and but the idea of predicting uh, future behavior, uh, it comes, uh, it goes back a bit further. Um, so probably one of the earliest places that we see that sort of thing coming up, that idea coming up, uh, is um, in a, a series of stories written I think in the 1950s uh, by Isaac Asimov. So if you've ever read the Foundation series, you've confronted this idea before, uh, where we have the character Harry Seldon, um, who invented this concept called psychohistory. I always get amused by uh, these uh, terms uh, where they put psycho, where it usually means like psychology, but it just sounds crazy, uh, uh, quite literally, uh, when you when you say these sort of things. Anyways, guess, so he studied, he invented a, a term called psychohistory, which is basically trying to uh, model uh, future events uh, based on social interactions on a large scale. And so uh, the general principle there is that uh, while it's impossible to model any any individual person, uh, you might be able to uh, model 
large communities and the responses to uh, different constraints and pressures. And so uh, he, Harry Seldon, uh, in, in the first story of the Foundation series, uh, tells the Emperor of the uh, Galactic Empire that his great Galactic Empire is going to collapse in a few hundred years. And, uh, and uh, this Emperor, who was at this place called Trantor, uh, laughed at him and told him to leave. We are the great empire and you can't tell us and, and we're never going to fall. And, uh, and then it did. And so uh, Harry Seldon uh, made what is called a foundation uh, to use these future predictions of events to try to limit the, the length of the Dark Ages that comes as a result of the collapse of this galactic empire. And that's the whole idea of the foundation stories. Um, Isaac Asimov based it on uh, the book of uh, the rise and fall of Roman civilization, the Roman Empire. Oh my god, I can't remember uh, what it's called. It's a classical work. And uh, and then he, he had the idea to write a short story on it. Uh, but then his editor convinced him to go ahead and write a whole series of stories about, uh, about, that, uh, about that world. And so uh, on that advice, I, uh, Isaac Asimov went ahead and um, and wrote uh, a whole string of stories, but in doing so, he had to sort of predict the future of what was going to happen. And then he realized that he can put that prediction into the story itself. And so, uh, and so that's um, and that's how that idea was born. Um, so, I, it is one of the most uh, famous uh, things that has come out of Isaac Asimov's work. And uh, and so he has a few statements that he's made in an interview about it. Um, and so uh, one interviewer asked him, do you think it would be good if there really was such a science of psychohistory? And, uh, and Isaac Asimov uh, responded, well, I can't help but think it would be good, except that in my stories, I always have opposing views. In other words, uh, people argue all possible, all possible ways of looking at psychohistory and deciding whether it is good or bad. So you can't really tell. I happen to feel sort of on the optimistic side. I think if we can somehow get across some of the problems that face us now, humanity has a glorious future. And if we could use those, use the tenets of psychohistory to guide ourselves, we might avoid a great many troubles. But on the other hand, it might create troubles. It's impossible to tell in advance. And so I, yes, Isaac Asimov was very much on the optimistic side, uh, but he probably did not anticipate an organization that is hell-bent on using future predictions uh, to manifest the apocalypse. Uh, and so, um, and which is more or less the, uh, the idea of uh, the Umbrella Academy. So uh, with that, I have sort of tied everything back uh, to the Umbrella Academy, and, uh, and yeah, that, that's sort of the... Uh, uh, sort of my academic overanalysis of uh, the Umbrella Academy. So I uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and um, and if you want to see more content like this, uh, please go ahead and like and subscribe, and uh, and every once in a while I'll post one of these. Um, I have an, a few ideas for Queen's Gambit, which is uh, popular on Netflix right now. Uh, also, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and uh, and a few other series. Uh, so. Uh, please do come back and if you like I uh, go ahead and uh, check out uh, the other content on my channel I have post my graduate courses and undergraduate courses up on here and uh, and so yeah if you want to learn some math um, You know go check it out anyway, so uh, this has been an over analysis and uh, I'll see you later